Only once in our world's history did a stable have something in it that was bigger than our whole world. That's what C.S. Lewis said. Only once was there something on this planet that was bigger than the planet. Jesus was born into the world he created. He was held by hands that he made exist. In fact, he was crucified by people that he knew in the womb, according to what the psalmist says. Something bigger than the world was in that manger. It was a gift from God. I wanna take the next few weeks to talk about this amazing gift that God gave to us. See, gift giving was not started by Retail America. God started the giving spree when he gave us the best of heaven. I want us to pray that today will be the day your life is changed by that gift, just as the world was changed 2,000 years ago. Father, I'm asking you in these next few moments, let us see the amazing gift that was given, that the gift that was in that manger was bigger, not just than a manger, but it was bigger than the planet itself because he created it. So God, today, let this not just be a sermon, let this not just be simply um, a church service, but let this be transformational. Let this be a moment that lives are transformed by the power of that gift, Jesus Christ, amen. The Gospel of Matthew records the Christmas story like this. You're going to see, as we read these words, how the close, close people are gonna be really far from that manger and very far people are actually gonna be closer than even the close people were geographically. Let me read to you Matthew's version of, version of this story. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go search carefully for the child. And when you have found them, report to me that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshiped him. And then opening up their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. This is how Matthew records the thing that has changed, the very story that has changed this planet. Think about this, this story starts. Matthew 2, 1 says it like this. Now, after Jesus was born, I want you to think about it this way. The great 19th century preacher, Charles Spurgeon said, when Jesus was born, a stir begins as soon as Christ is born. He has not even spoken a word. He has not even worked a miracle. He's not even proclaimed a single doctrine. Before he mounts the throne, friends bring him presents and his enemies plan his death. I have to say something about that night. It may have been a holy night, but it wasn't a silent one because a lot of stuff was starting to happen, both good and bad. Think about it. When you stop and actually think about that evening, it's mind boggling how the simple, unassuming birth of really a peasant boy of 2000 years ago in a stable in the Middle East has caused such a commotion all over this planet. His birthday causes traffic jams in New York City to Rio de Janeiro. It begins to stop traffic in London, England. You may not have even realized this, but every time you check your calendar or refer to the date, you are using Jesus Christ's birth as a reference point. Because of Jesus, history is actually divided into BC and to AD, which literally every event in history is dated to show how many years it has been since Jesus showed up on this planet. 
That's why the great preacher Ralph Sockman said it like this, the hinge of history is on the door of Bethlehem stable. But to define what Christmas over these next few weeks is all about, let me make it as simple as possible. Here's what is Christmas. Christmas is when God came down the stairs of heaven with a baby in his arms. Hallelujah. See, God's love and generosity amazes me, especially on that night. But what amazes me more, as we read Matthew chapter two, are the reactions of two groups of people in this story, the Magi and the scribes and the priests. Because you're gonna see in these next few moments how the close are really very far and the far are really actually close. You're gonna be challenged and I believe you're gonna be encouraged today. Let me just mention this first. The far are very close. That's the three magi. Listen to these words again in Matthew 2, 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. We Most people believe that there are three wise men because there were three gifts or three magi because of the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That's where that comes from. <laughs> I heard one person say, what if it wasn't three wise men and three wise women? They said the story maybe look a little bit different. They wouldn't have bought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They would have, first of all, asked directions. They would have helped deliver the baby. They would have cleaned the manger and the stable. They would have brought little outfits for Jesus, and they wouldn't have brought useless gifts to Jesus like gold, myrrh, and frankincense, but baby food, formula, and diapers. I love that. I know these are three wise men, but they amaze me for two reasons. And let me give you the first one. They are not just three guys from around the block. When that word east is used twice in that passage, they are, that means they are very far from this manger geographically in Bethlehem. East to Bethlehem was a huge journey. In fact, historians say, take the word east and the word Bethlehem in that passage, and historians say they had to come over a thousand miles probably to get through the desert to get to that manger. In fact, some of them say they probably, because of who they were, had maybe a band of 300 coming with them through the desert over a thousand miles from the east, Babylon, all the way there to Bethlehem to that manger. They were coming from the most advanced nation on the planet where the best minds of the day were, the intellectuals and the scientists. That's where they came from. And secondly, what really took my breath away was not just how far they came, but how they responded to what they saw in that manger. Let me explain for just a few moments. Were the three wise men, here's the question, were the three wise men disappointed when they got to the manger? Some of you may say, Pastor Tim, why are you saying that? Because this part is incredible. Babylon, they knew Babylon has kings on the throne. You read about the kings in the book of Daniel. Babylon has kings on the throne. These men have seen kings. They've seen royalty. They've bowed before kings. And now they come to Bethlehem and they see a baby in a manger. He didn't look like a king. There was no castle, but a stable. No scepter, no throne, no royal garb that they're used to seeing. Think about this. He couldn't even walk. Jesus couldn't even walk or talk. But those three men knew this was not just a king, but the king. And that he was more king than even Herod, who they talked to in that story. They saw beyond the manger. They saw beyond the present to the future. They knew they were looking at the king. J.C. Ryle, an old preacher from the past, said it like this, two of the greatest acts of faith in the Bible ever recorded is this, no greater faith than the thief on the cross. One thief saw him dying and still called him Lord. And he said, but the other was when these three men saw him as a baby in a mother's arms and bowed and worshiped him. Wow, that's an act of faith. You saw a baby, you saw with your eyes a baby, but your soul said, that's a king. 
This tells me that making Jesus king in your life is really by faith. You don't need to see it all to become a Christian. You don't even need to know it all to become a Christian, but I'm telling you, you come and bow before him, you get it all. When you begin to receive him by faith, the very far, thousand miles away, the men from the East somehow get very close and realize that geography and even what, even what their preconceived idea of royalty was, was all smashed to bits when they saw Jesus in that manger. I, I wanna speak to you for a second because there are some that are listening today. You may feel a thousand miles away from God right now. Just like those men who came from the east to Bethlehem. I wanna tell you a story. I was, reading, I was reading something about a church a few years ago that almost split over who the pastor's son, or really the, the, the new senior pastor that was getting ready to come into a position, who is the pastor's son, a church almost split over who the son was going to marry. Here's how the story went, that one Sunday in that very church, a young woman felt the tug of God at her heart and she responded to God's call. That young woman had a very difficult past, involved in alcohol and drugs and even prostitution. But the change in her was so powerful and so evident. King Jesus touched her and changed her from the inside out. As time went on, she not only became a faithful member, she literally became involved in ministries, teaching young children. And it wasn't long until that young lady caught the eye of the new pastor, who is the new senior pastor to be. The relationship grew and they began to make wedding plans. I was reading about this church that was facing this. This is when the problem began. The young pastor was be about to become the senior pastor and this woman would become his wife, but the church would have no part of that. One half of the church didn't even think that a woman with such a past was suitable for the pastor's son. And the church began to argue and fight over this very matter. So they decided to have a church meeting. That never goes well. And as the people made their arguments, tensions increased in the sanctuary. The meeting was getting completely out of hand. The young woman became so upset because she was there with her fiance. She ran out in tears. And as she began to cry, the pastor's son stood to speak because he couldn't bear the pain of watching his fiance walk out in tears. And this was what he said. I want you to listen carefully. My fiance's past is not what's on trial here. What you are questioning is the ability of the blood of Jesus to wash sins away. Today, you have put the blood of Jesus on trial. So my question to you, church body, is does it wash away sin or not? On that night, the whole church began to weep and they began to realize they didn't put that woman on trial. They began to slander the blood of Jesus. And I wanna say to you, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. End of case, end of story. I'm here to tell you today that no matter what you've done, no matter how far you feel away from God, a thousand miles from God, what gets you close to God? Promises? Nope. Not your goodness? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. That's how the far got very close and you can get close today. But let me finish with this. The close are very far. Those are the scribes and the priests, the religious people. Here's what it says, starting in verse three. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. Now, now get ready for these next verses. They, the priests and the scribes, the religious people, that's the they, they said to him in Bethlehem, they didn't even miss a beat, of Judea, this is what has been written. Now they're quoting the Old Testament by the prophet. And, and, and as they start quoting the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. The Danish theologian Soren Kierkegaard said it like this: powerful words. It's so much easier to become a Christian when you aren't one than to become one when you assume you already are. That's sobering. 
See, when Herod asked the religious people where he would be born, they didn't even need a concordance. They immediately knew the passage. They quoted a 700 year old prophecy from the book of Micah, Micah 5, 2, that he would be born in Bethlehem. They never missed a beat. Where would he be born? Micah 5, 2. From memory, they told it to him. Okay, strap in. And then what happened next from the religious people, from Herod, is mind boggling. Okay, what happened next after they quote Micah 5, 2? Remember, the Magi are the very far that got close. These people are close, but are really far away. So what happened? Here it is, nothing. No one moved, no one ran, no one bowed, no one brought any gifts, no one worshiped, no one did anything, they did nothing. They could quote the scripture, they knew the right answer, but they did nothing with it. They knew about the Bible. They knew Bible verses by heart. They knew about religious concepts and religious prophecy and Bible prophecy, but they didn't know Jesus. Their journey wasn't a thousand miles away. You ready for this? It was just five miles away. They tell us, historians tell us that where the discussion took place was only five miles from the manger and they didn't even make it because they knew facts about Jesus, but never experienced Jesus. It's like saying you've been to the Grand Canyon or Paris just because you saw pictures of those two places. Though you know about it, you never even experienced it. Maybe you purchased the new biography of former President Obama. It doesn't mean you know former President Obama. See, knowing about doesn't mean you experienced or even actually know. You could grow up in the church, be five rows from, from the altar and, and, and salvation and never make the journey to experience Jesus. You may have experienced church, you may have experienced religion, but have you experienced a relationship with Jesus, the great gift of God, the gift that we said in the very beginning, the only time in world history that something came down on this planet that was bigger than this planet. Let me, let me just pause for a second and say this. I've had people say to me these words, I tried Jesus and it didn't seem to work for me. When I hear those words, I immediately begin to interrupt them. And I say, stop right there. You didn't try Jesus and he didn't work. Because not when the Bible says these words, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. That's impossible for you to have tried Jesus, a relationship, the gift of God, and to say that you were disappointed. Church and religion, listen, and even pastors, even this pastor, will disappoint you. Jesus never disappoints you. That is why those priests and scribes were so close, but yet so far away. That's the saddest part of the story five miles away and never made the journey. The most famous clock in the world is in London, England. You know it, Big Ben. People all over the world hear its iconic chime every single day on the hour. People all over London, from prime ministers to Muslims to atheists, from parliament members to visitors from all over the planet, hear those iconic chimes. And every day on the hour, it plays the one song that people just continue to walk, not realizing the magnitude of the lyrics. When those chimes play, it is playing these words from the old, from the old hymn, I know my redeemer lives. No one realizes it, they just keep walking. Like the religious scribes, the religious Pharisees, so close. It's in earshot. Big Ben is telling the world right there in London, my Redeemer lives, he's resurrected, and they keep on walking by. Those, those scribes and Pharisees, they, they knew Micah 5 too. They knew that he would be born in Bethlehem, but did nothing about it. And some of you are listening today, and I want you 
not to be like these scribes and Pharisees, so close, listening, in earshot. God, help us that this, that these next few moments, that you would treat this like Big Ben and keep going on, but never respond. See, Christmas began in the heart of God, and it is complete only when it reaches the heart of man. Christmas, one man said, is not as much about opening our presents as much as it is about opening up our hearts. See, Christmas is based on a gift exchange. Listen, and God went first. Christmas is based on a gift exchange. And God went first on that night. The gift of God to man, his son Jesus. Then what's our gift back to God? Man's gift to God, our sinful hearts, and God loves receiving that gift. Pastor Tim, how can I receive the gift of the son? Jesus calls the receiving of that gift being born again. See, here's what we have to make sure that we don't get ourselves caught up in the very close or so far away. Because some people would say, well, I've been water baptized. I've, I've, I've had communion. I've, I've gone to church. I'm a good person. This, these are the things that sometimes that are good to do, but sometimes can even distance us from the very gift of receiving the gift of his son and that relationship. You can do all of this, communion, water baptism, show up at church, even watch this sermon on, on your laptop or on your phone. You can do all this and be very far. But today, I want the far to become very close. See, born again, that relationship, giving our heart to Jesus, born again is a Jesus term. It's not mine, it's not Times Square Church. It's a Jesus term. He uses it in John chapter three. In fact, Jesus says, no man can see the kingdom of heaven unless they're born again. In fact, Jesus says two verses later that in John three, five, you must be born again, which means don't make optional. What Jesus says is a necessity. That's where the relationship begins. That's how we begin to give the, the only gift that we have, our sinful hearts, our lives to Jesus. In, in, and it may be shattered, broken, dirty, and filled with disappointment of the past. And God goes, I want that because I can change that. Well, Pastor Tim, how does that happen? How, how do I become born again? See, just as you had a first birth, for most of you in a hospital, just as you had a first birth, Jesus tells us you need a second birth. The first one was physical. The second one is spiritual. Just as you have a birthday or a birth date, you need a spiritual birthday or spiritual birth date. Well, how does that happen? We, we wanna make it as simple as these three letters, A, B, C. Just like we would tell our children, learn the ABCs first. This is just the beginning. This is the start of a journey that can change your life. This is the start of the journey of receiving into your life, of being born again, of this being today, being your spiritual birthday, receiving God's gift. A, it's admitting that I'm a sinner. It's when I get honest with God that all of us, including me, have a condition and it's called sin. It can't be fixed with a promise, a program. There's not a priest or a pastor that can fix it. We, we need help to fix us. I'm broken on the inside and the diagnosis is sin and I have to start with admitting I'm a sinner. One, one pastor said it like this, we're not mistakers in need of correction, we're sinners in need of a savior. We're, we need more than a second chance, we need a second birth. How does that happen? That's the B word, believe. It's believing that God sent his son to fix our sinful condition. I, I, I can't fix myself. If we could fix ourselves, then, then why would God have to send his own son that night to come into this world as a gift to change us. If I could get myself to heaven by being good, then Jesus would never have to come and die on the cross. Jesus's death for me was him taking my place, him being my sin bearer. See, he died the death I should have died. He lived the life I couldn't live and he gave me a reward, heaven and forgiveness that I didn't even deserve. But it's finally, not only admitting, not only believing, but see, it's confessing him as Lord. Now that's a big one. That's not just saying something with your lips. That's declaring with your heart and mouth, Lord, which means boss. Do you think that God 
sent Jesus to die on a cross to get us just to simply watch a service online or just to get us inside of a church building. His goal wasn't to get us to church. His goal was to get us to eternity, to be with him in heaven forever. Coming to church on Sunday for a specified time, with whatever time that is, and whenever we get to have a chance to meet back together, coming to church on a Sunday and doing our time in church, that's religion. Being born again, that's a relationship. See, Christianity is not coming to a place, but it's coming to a person, and that person now becomes in charge of our life. He is Lord, Romans 10, 9, and 10. And as I said, that word means boss. I, I, I don't do what God wants me, what God wants for an hour on Sunday. I don't do that. It's not an hour that God wants. God doesn't want that hour. God wants every single day. That's called lordship. And today could be your second birth date. Today could be your spiritual birth date. Today, it could happen right now, wherever you are. This could be the day that the, those that feel a thousand miles away, you feel like you're from the East. I'm telling you, the journey, that thousand mile journey today can be literally in a matter of moments be taken care of by praying a prayer that says, I want Jesus in my life. I receive your gift that you sent to us 2000 years ago. Come on, if that's you right now, I don't, you may be a father, you may be a mother, you may be sitting there with your family. Maybe someone sent you the link to this and you're listening on a, on a treadmill or on an elliptical. You're in a car on the way to an airport. You're, you're sitting waiting for a plane today. Maybe, maybe you're even on a job interview and you're listening to this because you, you, had, you needed to kill some time. And I'm telling you, this gift of salvation, this gift being born again can change you today. The thousand miles could be fixed right now. Pastor Tim, then how does this happen? I want you to pray this prayer with me. If you're able to, I want you to say it out loud. Maybe you say it as a family. Maybe husband and wife take the hand of each other and you pray this prayer. Come on, let's say this prayer together. Dear Lord Jesus, come on, say it out loud. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. I believe you faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Come on, say it with me now. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is is my home in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Congratulations for those that prayed this prayer. These aren't magic words. These are are just simply, I'm adding words to 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 a need of the heart today. If that came from your heart, congratulations. Today is your spiritual birthday. I I wanna give you just one challenge today. If you prayed this prayer, and you're gonna see this on the screen below, I want you to text one word, and that's the word decided, D-E-C-I-D-E-D, just that simple word, to 88202. That's just a simple step that we wanna help you with to say, you've just started on a lifelong journey. How long, Pastor Tim? All the way into eternity. And we just wanna help you with your next steps. Text decided to 88202. Today, you have received the gift that God sent to us 2,000 years ago. The thousand miles has just been bridged, and now you are born again. God bless you.